everyone. The ones who are back from lunch. Um, I'm Hudson Jameson. Uh, I work for the foundation doing DevOps documentation, uh, kind of dApp developer, just kind of organizing DevCon, doing all that stuff. So I'm really excited to be here. And um, if, if you've seen me online, my nickname is Souptacular on there. And then uh, Piper, you can go ahead. Uh, I'm Piper Merriam. Some of you met me yesterday at the end of the day. Uh, I maintain a lot of the Python uh, tooling for Ethereum. Uh, I've worked with Vitalik a bit on proof of concept implementations for Casper and just kind of general Ethereum developer. Cool. All right, well, let's get started. We're going to teach you about Solidity today. So Solidity is a high-level language uh, for Ethereum contracts. So what that means is uh, so we don't have to go and do like ones and zeros or like low level assembly code or things like that. We have a high level language that uh, makes it much easier for humans to be able to uh, code, you know, at a level they understand and then put it through the compiler into uh, what will come out into the Ethereum network. Uh, Solidity looks a lot like JavaScript, but with types. Um, it's sort of this interesting amalgamation of of the two. Uh, this is a very simple Solidity contract. Uh, the highest level thing that we reason about in, in Solidity is the contract object. Uh, you can think of a contract kind of like a class if you're used to object-oriented programming. Um, and the contracts expose some number of functions. All right. So the uh, code is compiled to the Ethereum virtual machine. You all have probably been hearing about that a lot today. Um, pretty much it's just like it takes the human readable code and then puts it into a bunch of gargly gook like ones and zeros and uh, makes it so that the Ethereum network can read it in a way that the computer can understand. Um, once it's on the EVM, it's completely isolated. So that's something a lot of people forget, but once uh, contract code is on the Ethereum network, it can't do things like go and uh, you know ping the weather.com and get the latest weather. They have to have a human intermediary because there it is isolated. There's no outside network or other types of connections. Um, and the reason for that uh, isolation is that everything that executes in the EVM has to be completely deterministic, um, which is why you can't generate random numbers easily inside of the EVM. It requires some outside interaction. Uh, contracts, are very, oh, contracts are very easy to write, um, but they're very difficult to write securely, um, especially if you need to house value or other people's funds. Um, this is a pretty straightforward looking function. Uh, we've got a withdraw function for some wallet contract. It checks to make sure that there is enough in the account to withdraw. It sends the funds that they asked to withdraw, and then it sets the balance to what, um, to the new balance. This will let somebody completely drain this contract of funds. Um, um, this is exactly what happened to the DAO. Um, I have this line underlined because what actually happens here is that this executes, can execute code on the address that this is sending to. And since the account balance is only deducted on the next line, that means that that contract can call back into the withdraw method, which will execute that line again. And it can do this circularly, at least until it runs out of gas, which means that it can, if it can get through 100 loops of doing this, it means it can withdraw 100 times the amount that it has. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess this is me. Public functions, let's go over these. They're uh, callable by anybody. So you have this uh, like wallet that has an asset on it, and you're you know like I'm gonna make a Hudson coin, a Huds coin, and uh, you go in there and you're like I want anybody who has access to Huds coins to be able to check their balance. So you make that uh, function public. That means anyone can call it. Um, as we'll see in a second, internal functions are only callable from inside the contract. So as you can see, there's a lot of parallels to many other programming languages here. Um, internal functions are good for um, you know, things that you only want other functions to call so that people can't manipulate them and do weird things with them. Cool. Uh, your public functions are the API that you expose to the world. Um, you can think of these as your API endpoints. Um, 
They're the things that you allow outside actors to interact with your contract with. Um, one of the interesting things is, that is happening right now is that some standards are beginning to emerge for how we write contracts. Um, you can think of these like HTTP web standards. Uh, this is the ERC-20 standard. Um, this is the standard interface that token contracts inter um, should implement. Uh, there's this small set of functions, but this interface is implemented across all of the major token contracts that are live on the network right now, and that common interface, that like standard that has emerged, um, is allowing some pretty awesome things to happen. So uh, if anyone's been to the Etherscan website, it's a very popular Ethereum blockchain explorer. Uh, you can go there and they actually have a, a search feature where if um, any other contract is using the ERC-20 standard, you can search for tokens within that contract. It'll, uh, you'll just be able to put the contract address and it'll uh, tell you, you know, your balance and give you everything you need because it's a standard that's set across uh, any smart contract that implements it. Uh, it's very interesting. What we have right here is actually uh, maker tokens, I believe, uh, as because they implemented the ERC-20 interface. And there's some variations people use um, to do different things with ERC-20, but uh, for the most part, it's uh, and pretty standardized. A lot of people are using the same standard, which is great that the community can come together and do something like that. One of the cool things that these kind of standards enable is this, which is a completely de decentralized exchange where you can trade token pairs um, on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, oh. Yeah, so the cool thing about this, like why would we want something like EtherX? Uh, the reason is uh, it doesn't have a middleman, it's instant settlement or instant, like pretty close to instant settlement, and you control the assets. So a lot of the time you forget, you know, things like this happening. And the reason this happened was because it wasn't decentralized. They, um, Mt. Gox was a Bitcoin exchange. Uh, they had a lot of people's Bitcoin and then they got uh, hacked and the Bitcoin stolen. If we were using something like uh, EtherX right here, that is less likely to happen because uh, the contracts just all talk to each other autonomously within the Ethereum network. Let's see. Oh, so Solidity is about two years old. And uh, since then, uh, the community's come together and made a ton of tools. You've seen a lot of these today from other presenters, and you're going to see more. Uh, what we have here on the left is some uh, integrated development environments. So some of the more uh, popular ones are Browser Solidity. That's a a uh, compiler and um, basically full Solidity suite uh, for debugging and everything within your browser. Uh, we also have Ethereum Studio and Visual Studio, which uh, are IDEs and plugins. And then if you look at the bottom, if you recognize any of those uh, symbols, that means that your uh, text editor has support for Solidity syntax or Solidity compilation or things like that. If you look at the right, we have tools. Uh, Rain earlier today went over SolGraph, which is a really, really powerful tool. Uh, we also have uh, Selenium, which is a linter, uh, Truffle, Dapple, Populous, and Embark, which are uh, frameworks for building dApps. So really, you have a ton of uh, different tools to come in and help you learn, because it can be a rough ride at first. So, oh. yeah, go ahead. Uh, so this is browser solidity. Um, this is magic. Uh, you can go to this in your browser right now, if you can get the internet to work. And write a contract, compile it here in your browser without any tooling on your machine, deploy it to a test EVM running in your browser without you needing to install anything on your machine, and interact with it right here on this website. Uh, the uh, browser solidity is an amazing, amazing tool, um, and it is a really easy way to get started tinkering around with Ethereum contracts. Yeah, definitely. So. I was going to put a list of resources like, okay, I'm out there in the audience or watching online. I want to get started. What do I do? What we've done is if you go to the Ethereum subreddit, uh, it's like an online forum. Uh, there's a post that's at the top of the home page of the Ethereum subreddit, and it has all kinds of links. It has a getting started guide, 
Um, some of the things that people are going to be familiar with and that are real uh, easy to use, uh, we have our own Stack Exchange. So if you're a developer with different languages and you use Stack Exchange, Ethereum has its own Stack Exchange that actually has over 3,000, I believe 3,500 questions answered. Uh, we also have uh, ethdocs.org, which is a community-built documentation site. Uh, we're looking all the time for people to uh, come in, help out with that effort. And uh, we also have, uh, of course, ethereum.org, which has a short getting started. And then on top of that, we have plans in the future to expand on maybe things like examples, tutorials. And then, of course, for Solidity, there is a Solidity um, documentation that is constantly updated with every release. Uh, so uh, it's very, very good resource. Um, on top of all that, you're in there. It's going to be kind of uh, hectic at first if you've never used Solidity. There's a little bit of a learning curve. So come to our Gitter chat rooms, uh, and uh, that's going to be, I think, gitter.im slash ethereum. We have developers and different channels there at all times that will be happy to help you get started with Ethereum. Uh, so I think with that, the only other thing I have to remind you guys, um, go ahead cool. and talk about your thing. Um, so I've signed up about 10% of the conference uh, for uh, DevCon 2 identities. Um, I'd love to get a much deeper sign up. So. Uh, send me your information. Um, I don't know if we can get the slide. Yeah, the slide can't come up. But I will say this. If you walked out early yesterday, you missed the most amazing announcement. Cool. Because what we have here is a memento on the Ethereum blockchain that you can uh, pull up. Uh, or you can so, like, uh, yeah. so I am issuing one, uh, one of these to every person here that wants one. Uh, they won't be issuable after Thursday morning at 8 a.m. Um, and the idea is this is an experiment to see what can we do with the ability to let people interact with something knowing that they were here at this conference. Um, there are some interesting ideas that I have for what you could build on top of this. Um, one of them might be if there's another hard fork proposal at some point, we could use this as the permissions for voting in one vote to see what this community thinks about that idea, as opposed to the entire community of people who own Ether. Um, might be interesting to see what the difference between those two votes are. That is really um, interesting, yeah. All you have to do is send me your information. Yeah, Piper's camped out like outside at a desk uh, with some stickers, and if you come over there with your Ethereum address, you'll be in a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity smart contract to be able to provide, you know, your input in future events potentially. So, super exciting stuff. I'm really excited about Solidity. If you need any help with it, find me on Reddit. My name is Souptacular on there. Uh, it's a great name. It's my, yeah. And then Piper's on there as a... Uh, Piper Merriam. Piper Merriam. Find him on there too. He's super helpful. We're nice guys. Come see us. Thank you.